been, brother? Good, good. Just getting back into fall training the last couple of weeks. It's exciting. When do you decide to start running your dogs? Like, what 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 is your the thing that you see that says, okay, now now I'm going to start uh, training in earnest? Well, the hope is always by September, <clears throat> um, and we try to go if it's 50 degrees or cooler, or or a little bit warmer and raining and windy somewhere around there. <clears throat> yeah, that's pretty much, uh, I, I try to keep to the rule of the forties as long as it's not over 50 degrees or, uh, I'm, I'm going to be breaking the below 50 degree rule maybe this year a little bit, but we'll, <laughs> we'll find out later. Um, but man, it's good to have you on. I think, uh, we got to meet in person. We, we were friends on, on social media, but we got to meet in person was it 2023 Willow, the last Willow race? Yeah, yeah, the last Willow 300. Yeah, um, we were uh, sitting across the uh, the room, and and uh, Hugh Neff was over there, and uh, he's uh, a, always been a real friendly guy on social media, and always offering me a lot of advice as I was starting to transition from a recreational to a a racing uh, team. So I went over to say hi to him, and he introduced us, and. Looks like you've got a nice little family started there too. Yeah. Yeah. The kids are getting big, man. They, uh, my daughter just started kindergarten this last couple of weeks and yeah, it's been interesting, but I had, um, I had been following your story a little bit, just kind of through social media and, um, <clears throat> was, uh, kind of seemed like for a time we were kind of on the same timeline of like qualifying races. And then you had the unfortunate incident before the copper based. And so I knew of you going into the Willow 300 and <clears throat> I was fascinated with you. I've always kind of been fascinated with the CVs too, who you were running with. And um, so I was like, I got to meet that guy. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I, I tell you, uh, Mitch has, Mitch CV has been, um, uh, you know, he's, he, he reminds me a lot of, you know, like my parents' generation, he's, you know, a, a firm, hard, stern guy, but he's also, you know, got a big heart too. And he's always really been there. Um, I mean, I think it was what, 16, 17 years ago, uh, I had just gone through a divorce and I was trying to decide whether I was going to move to Alaska or not. And, um, he welcomed me up even back then. So, uh, we, we've been, we've been in uh, communication off and on ever since then. And, uh, you know, pushing for the centennial pushing for 2025 for, uh, for my breed, he, he really created a great opportunity for me there. And I was grateful for it. Um, uh, unfortunately, like you said, I, uh, I really just ripped my knee out, like everything that could ping, ping down wow. in that accident. And, um, when you saw me, I, I, I just, uh, you know, I was like, I'm, I'm not going back to Maine without a, without a race under my belt coming up here. And, uh, Mitch was, you know, he was a little on the fence as to whether or not I'd be able to pull it off. Um, and I, I didn't even want to go to a doctor until I found out it, you know, until I got back home, I, I didn't even want to know what was wrong to, with the knee till I got back home. But, um, but he trusted me and, uh, of course, you know, trust, but verify he, he had me take the team out a few times before the willow to make yeah. sure that I was good to go and, and all like that. And, uh, it, it was a great, it was a great experience. Um, so you were on track though, to hit the Iditarod last year, right? Is that correct? You were going to do it last year and then you hit the, the snag. With no, the I, uh, <clears throat> well, I could have done it last year with the new rules. They changed the qualifying rules to where, they changed it this year to where you can sign up if you still need one more qualifier and you, you just have to complete the qualifier before the food drops. That's awesome. Um, but that's a new rule. So um, it was always kind of, once I got started with Jim, it was always the plan to do this upcoming Iditarod. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, when I finished the Copper Basin last year, that kind of checked the final qualifier box. Yeah, so you're you are the rookie to watch this year. Uh, I I looked over your race record and uh, man, that's that's pretty impressive. And I I think I know why. I mean, I I know you played some college football. Um, you know, I I 
I didn't play any high school sports. I was, uh, I was a chess club president. I sang in the choir and played piano and uh, I knew I was soft. So I decided, you know, I was going to address that. So I joined the Marine Corps and they helped to, um, you know, to deal with that. But, uh, so the Marine Corps kind of taught me the whole, you know, um, you know, be strong, suck it up, move forward, press forward. But what I, I never really got, and I'm, I just, you know, I've been trying to absorb it as much as I can lately is the competitive side of training. And uh, I'm guessing that your experience as a, as a football player and in college playing football, that kind of thing, um, athletics, does that, how, how has that affected your, uh, your discipline going into, you know, training and being competitive? Cause you've, you've, from day one, you've run competitively, even in your Bethel days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd say I'm a rookie to watch. I don't know if I'm the rookie to watch, <laughs> but, um, and, and really most of what has enabled me to be competitive is I've happened to be in amazing situations. Uh, first with Myron Angsman and Bethel, and now with Jim Lanier and Chugiak, they have some really good dogs. That that's the main thing that's allowed me to do it. But I think um, also, yeah, I'm I'm a very competitive guy, um, and playing football, I'm not the biggest guy, and I actually played um, linebacker in college. Oh, I think wow. my playing weight at, in college was about two ten, okay. so I was not big. Um, but I kind of, but yeah, so I kind of learned a lot about just like, yeah, the intent kind of had to bring the intensity all the time, had to like push forward and overcome obstacles. And mostly like, I think what a lot of has to do with that is the belief in yourself. Yeah. I can do this. I can be competitive, which applies in football. And I think, um, applies to mushing as well. Yeah. I've, um, my, I have three boys that have played football now and two of them are in the Marine Corps and one is uh, signing up this year, but uh, I, I see what I see what football's done for them, and I, I kind of connected the dots watching them over the last few years, and uh, and spending the time that I did with Mitch, just seeing how you you know how you properly build a team, you know, um, and seeing that you know how you have all of these repetitive baby steps over and over and over again, you know, to build towards success and. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I saw that with Mitch's training strategy and I saw that with, uh, you know, the football teams that my boys have played with. And I was just wondering if you felt like there was a, a correlation with, with, with what you do. Well, I think part of it that kind of relates to setting up a dog team and setting up a football team is there's this idea of trust, right? N neither of them are individual sports. Yeah, there's only one musher, but as, as you know, it's a team. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in football too, everybody has a job to do. Like if you're on defense, everybody has a specific gap to cover, a specific man to cover. And you not only have to do your job, but you have to trust that the man next to you is going to do their job. And I think, I think that that can kind of apply to mushing too. Um, you don't want to try to do too much as a musher. Um, but you also don't want to try to do too little and it's trusting that your dogs are going to do that. Trusting that your dogs are going to do their job if they've been trained up to do it. And of course the dogs really have to trust you that you're going to do their, your job and take care of them and get them down the trail safely. <clears throat> and the other thing, like you said, is it's, um, it's like baby steps, right? Like in the world of football, you don't, um, I mean, maybe the NFL guys do, but m most teams don't show up on day one and you install the entire offense and defensive package, right? It's a little bit at a time. And so it's the same approach we take to training, like, you know, shorter runs, slowly build on it. Um, when we'll do our first camping trips of the year, it's still short runs, fairly short camps, followed by a short run. And we just continue to build on that and build on that and build on that until mm -hmm. hopefully we're ready to go on race day. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, 
For, for the listeners who don't really know you, and uh, I, I want to encourage everyone to check out your website. You've got a killer website. Um, but uh, for those who don't know you, you were born in Alaska, but then you moved to the lower 48, West Coast, the lower 48. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself? I, and particularly, I want to know about your volunteer time with the, the Jesuit Corps as well. Yeah, so... Um... Born in Anchorage, Alaska, um, I, we lived in Palmer um, till I was about six. So I went to um, I went to kindergarten in Alaska, and uh, actually, at first, we moved from there to to West Texas. Now, when you're when you live in Alaska, especially when you're a kid, you get instilled in you this like Alaska is so special. Alaska is so special from an early age. So I was not happy when we left. All I've heard is how special this place is. I love it here. Why are we leaving? And I always wanted to come back. And um, part of the other reason I wanted to come back is I remember when I was in kindergarten, uh, Susan Butcher and Martin Boozer visited my school and gave this oh, whole shit. sled dog presentation. And I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Like, wow, this is so Alaskan and at that time, it was, um, you know, Martin at that time was a real up and comer. He was on his way uh, to being a major, major player. Susan had already won four races and was in the middle of the big rivalry with, with Rick, who was going to win their fifth. I think that year um, after I saw Martin and Susan was when Rick won his fifth I did her out of that famous 91 where he goes through the storm and all that stuff. So anyway... So after I left Alaska, I was always like, I'm going to come back and I'm going to run the Iditarod. So it took a long time. Um, after a few years in Texas, we moved to um, Spokane, Washington, where I uh, went to went to school, went to university, played a couple years of football, uh, blew out my knee, sim similar to what you did, wrecked about everything that was in my knee um, and ended up transferring to um Gonzaga University. Uh, graduated from there and then um, like probably happens to a lot of people, I was floundering after college. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, <clears throat> and I was kind of trying different jobs and trying to figure it out. And I had a conversation with my dad one day and he said, have you ever thought about the Peace Corps? I thought that's actually really interesting. Um, that would be really cool. It kind of fits with my values. And then I thought, well, I wonder if the Peace Corps goes to Alaska. And they're like, maybe I could like figure this out to where I also end up back in Alaska. So as I started to explore it, I um, learned a little bit more about this organization with the Jesuit Volunteer Organization, which I had known a little bit about. Um, Gonzaga being a Jesuit institution. Okay. And, and, and so do, do you have like a uh, Catholic roots in your family or? Yeah. Raised, raised Catholic. Okay. And um, I, the uh, region I live in right now is 94% Catholic. Um, I, I, I'm a sixth generation Tennessean and, and the joke, you know, down there, I, I was actually watching a stand up comedian. He said, he said, where are the Baptists in the room? They raise their hands. Where, where are the, uh, the assembly of God in the room? They raise their hands. And he goes, where's the Catholics in the room? He goes, no, really? I want to see one. I've never met a Catholic. <laughs> so, so I went from not knowing a Catholic to living in an area where, you know, nine out of 10 of my friends are Catholic. Yeah. So I was curious about that. Well, so um, I'm actually a uh, third generation in my family to graduate from Gonzaga. And not only is that a Jesuit school, it is also the Jesuit retirement community. So whenever any Jesuit on the West Coast retires, they live at Gonzaga mm -hmm. um, on campus there. So you meet a lot of um, really interesting um, old priests in that. So um, so I started to explore that and I was a little bit late to kind of throwing out my application for that. And in Alaska, there was still positions open in Bethel. And I think there was one in Sitka. Um, and so I, I jumped at the chance, uh, to move out to Bethel, um, which actually the interest, other interesting thing about that is the Jesuit volunteer Corps, 
uh, it's a worldwide organization. It started in St. Mary's, Alaska was the okay. first place. They don't have volunteers any there anymore, but the closest place to St. Mary's where there is Jesuit volunteers is Bethel. That was like right where the, the whole thing started. Um, and we had, I think there was nine of us volunteers. We all lived in the same house together. We had different positions. I worked for, I volunteered at a community services foundation um, where we not only helped with like grants in the community, um, but we were working on developing some financial education curriculum for like, uh, for kids and young adults out there. Yeah, that's fantastic. And then we just, um, we also, everybody knew about the JVs in Bethel. They'd been there for 30 years. And so you showed up and it was just like, hey, you need somebody to come volunteer at this community event. Like it was no questions asked. We were there. So it was a really cool experience. That's awesome. Um, uh, and while I was there, um, so of course, part of this was, again, I'm trying to come to Alaska. I'm trying to figure out uh, sled dogs. And one day Myron Anksman, um, uh, who was uh, living out there, called the house and said, is anybody interested in coming to run sled dogs? And then from there, I think I was there every single day uh, <laughs> <laughs> while well, I still lived in Bethel. That's awesome. So uh, uh, I'm going to start referring to you as the, as the Jesuit musher. That's pretty <laughs> and the, the Jesuits, for those who don't understand, the Jesuits are kind of like the Marine Corps of the Catholic priesthood, right? I mean, those guys are hardcore. Yeah, that's one, that's one way to put it. For sure. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so, you you were not only just uh, baptized into mushing, but you were baptized in a competitive mushing like right away, right? I mean, because that was a competitive kennel from day one. Yeah. Um, so if you don't know much about Myron, he um, he's actually the founder of the Cusquim 300 race um, and was the president of it for a long time. Uh, actually won it twice. Uh, back in the eighties, I think. And so he just, you know, really had a, had a good dog team and, uh, mostly, uh, his focus at that time was the bogus Creek 150, which, uh, is kind of the little brother race to the Cuscoquim 300. Back then they used to run them even on the same weekend. So Myron would run the 150 and then, uh, one year I got to run the B team. So Myron took the A team. I took the B team. And so, you know, Myron was trying to win it. We were, we were, um, we were training to, to win that race and we did really well. And like all of the other kind of local small races, but yeah, it was right into competitive from the first time I started learning about everything. And how'd you get, uh, how'd you get plugged into, um, with, with Lanier? with uh, Dr. Lanier, right? Did it Dr. Lanier? Yeah. So, um, uh, it took a while. I was, um, after a few years running with Myron, I, I kind of just, Bethel's an awesome place, but if you don't know, it's, uh, it's not on the road system. You can't drive there. It's about 300 miles ish due west of Anchorage. And there's not a lot out there. Um, so I got to a point where I was like, man, I just, I got to get back on the road system. Um, moved to Fairbanks for a little while, kind of had my own like small team, kind of dabbled in sprint mushing a little bit. And I kind of just realized like, uh, I wasn't making the kind of money to be able to like have a true racing kennel the way I envisioned yeah. it. And I was a stupid young 20 year old making some questionable decisions. And I realized like, Hey, I got to kind of reset from dog mushing here and focus on, uh, focus on building a career. You know, I want to start a family. And so that's what I did. And, and, and then I moved down to the Anchorage area and, uh, um, got married to my lovely wife. And, uh, every year around Iditarod time, I would just become obsessed and I'd, you know, follow in the trackers. And then I'd start thinking, well, maybe I could have a dog team and I'd start doing spreadsheets and how much is this going to cost me and all this stuff. And it just, every time, you know, just, this is yeah. a financially terrible idea. Yeah. Uh, maybe I shouldn't do it. So I'd always talk myself out of it every year. 
so a few years ago, just kind of same thing happens. And, um, I did our odds starting up and I look at my wife and I go, well, should I do my annual determine that it's way too expensive to have a dog team? idea?" <laughs> and she looks at me and she goes, will you just do it? We just figure out a way to make it happen. Just figure it out. So I was like, well, yeah, I guess we could probably have four or six dogs. And she goes, no, no, no. You want to do I did her out. I know you want to do I did her wow. out. Figure out how to make that. Well, you, you, you landed a good one. She's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> like, of course, now she uh, she can't complain, right? Like, oh, yeah. I'm gone for all the time training. I'd say, hey, this was your idea. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so I started like trying to figure out what the best way to make that happen is. You know, I knew people had, um, um, you know, as handlers run other other people's dogs in Iditarod. And yeah. I was kind of trying to figure out how to make that happen and, and still maintain my current job and still have time to be a, a husband and father and everything. And so as it turned out, the closest kennel to where I live was Jim Lanier. No joke. And so I just, um, I started to meet more people in the community and found somebody that I hounded into giving me Jim's phone number <laughs> and, uh, and then I called him up, up one day and, uh, like demanded to meet him. Like, Hey, I'll come over. And just, I told him, you know, I, I basically demanded to scoop poop in his yard. I said, you know, I, I would like to run dogs. I'm not saying I'll have to, I'll pay my dues. Um, kind of forced him to take, to take me on. And one thing led to another. And next thing I know I was, I'm racing the A team for Jim. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, and uh, another good friend of mine uh, actually just crashed at his house when I was on my heading up to Nome. Um, uh, Larry Dougherty uh, also ran dogs with uh, Jim Lanier for a while, right? Yeah, he got started with Jim. I think he did his qualifying even with Jim. Um, Larry's a great guy. He, uh, he did a couple of uh, training runs with us, with us last year. Cool. Yeah, that's super cool. So, uh, tell me, I, I, I've always been curious. Um, tell me about the Northern Whites. Um, tell me what, uh, every, every Alaskan Husky musher has their secret sauce and, um, you don't have to give any trade secrets away, but, uh, what, what to you makes, um, uh, and for those who don't know, the Northern Whites are, uh, what Jim Lanier's, uh, breeding program, his dogs are referred to that, uh, 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 that Mike is, is running. So tell me, uh, tell me about, tell me about the Northern whites, what, um, makes them unique to you? Uh, what makes them stand out in your mind to, to other lines of Alaskan Huskies? Well, I suppose the first and most obvious thing is they're all white, <laughs> hence the name, the Northern whites. Um, most dog teams that you'll see, you know, the black dogs, brown dogs, mixed, you know, occasional white dog here. But I guess the story is um, 20 some odd years ago, uh, Jim did a breeding and it was a white dog to a white dog. Uh, white being a recessive gene, it produced 12 pure white puppies. <laughs> <clears throat> and so they thought that was really cool. And decided from then on they would only breed white dogs to white dogs. Um, <clears throat> now there's uh, the team that we have now, or the dogs that are kind of in the main team now, um, is kind of a really uh, interesting mix of bloodlines. Some of it goes back to uh, just Jim's old stuff, kind of Jim's original stuff. Um, then at, at one point there's like a Susan Butcher dog that crops up in the pedigree. Um, a lot of dogs came out of a dog that we got from, or that he got from uh, Ray Reddington Jr. And then a couple of dogs from, um, from Jeff King. So it's kind of um, mixed with the stuff Jim's always had just some really good lines and, and um, Jim's been working at the, you know, breeding these animals for, for 25 years or more. Um, and he, he's not just looking for white. Sure. Um, so, so I think it's, it, it's a really remarkable animal. Um, they, 
everybody likes to say that these dogs really have a lot of personality, a lot of intelligence. Um, and yeah, man, they just want to, they just want to go, go, go. Yeah. Um, I think it was Nick Petit was looking at some of my dogs and, uh, said, uh, cause I have a lot of, and it's not intentional. Um, I, I could, I could feel the, uh, I could feel the team of pure white cephalos right now if I wanted to. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and Nick Petit made the joke. He said, he said, Jim Lanier might be interested in, in one of your dogs. Um, and, and uh, I think especially some of my females, like are, um, are they build wise? Are they, uh, um, are they smaller than average? Are, are they taller than average? <laughs> If you compared them to what your competitors are running, like in confirmation, what would you, what would you say? Um, I would say that uh, a, a lot of the males now, especially the young males, are a little bit on the bigger, bigger side, slightly bigger side. Um, we do have some rather small females that are just spectacular, but kind of the the usual female in Jim's yard is like this really long rangy type dog, a lot of speed and a lot of intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, kind of the main group also really well coated, really well coated and suited for travel, which um, is good, especially because we train in Chugiak where it's generally warmer than any than anywhere else. So yeah, we kind of have to be a little bit more cognizant of the weather when it is warm in fall training. Um, but hopefully they, they still kind of maintain that good coat to when it gets cold and we have to race against all those guys from Fairbanks that just live in that stuff, you know. <laughs> so uh you're you're running the Iditarod, man. You you're you're there. You you're uh, you're making it happen. How's that feeling? It's it, it, it's unbelievable. I, like I said, I mean, I, I think I put this idea came into my head when I was, you know, six years old that I was going to do it someday and multiple stops and starts and in, um, in trying to make that dream happen. And I'm I'm signed up. It just it still feels really surreal. <clears throat> um, it started to feel a little bit more real now that we've we've started training. Um, <clears throat> more seriously i'm like okay now like i'm every day one step closer one step closer and it's just to me i've um i'm a big sports guy i've always been fascinated by competition um i love alaska and this is this is the sport the competition um in alaska and on top of that it's an opportunity to uh, go all the way across the state without having to use a motor, without having <clears throat> any of that stuff, just doing it the old school way. And <clears throat> I feel so connected to Alaska. I, I feel like that's, it, it was always calling me back. Yeah. So now I have this opportunity to like see so much of it just from the back of a dog team. It's, it's really exciting. I, I, I can't wait to get started. A lot, lot of work between now and, uh, oh, yeah. and the day it starts a lot of work, but, uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited. That's awesome. I, um, I just went for my uh, registered main guide uh, license and I had to sit down for over an hour and be interrogated by game wardens on laws and rules and regulations and all that stuff. And um, at the end of it, uh, this old salty uh, game warden, he says, he says, Jonathan, he said, I'd trust you to take me on a overnight dog sled trip in, in the North main woods. And I was like, thank you. And he said, and I'd trust you to, take me on a canoe trip, uh, overnight canoe trip down the Allagash. And I was like, thanks. He, he said, but you don't like motors, do you? <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, no, sir, I don't. <laughs> I'm like, I am not a wrench turner. I, I was, I was, uh, crashing and burning on every, uh, question that they were asking me about ATVs, snowmobiles and all. I just, it's just not my thing. And, and, um, so yeah, I mean, I'd rather be on a horse than a snow than a than a dirt bike. I'd rather be on a dog sled team than a snowmobile. It's just how I've always been, and and strangely, I, I I'm a sixth generation Tennessean, but growing up as a kid, I always said when I grow up, I'm going to move where there's snow. And in the Marine Corps, I got uh, I just signed up for infantry, but ended up in a cold weather infantry unit, 
and uh, fell in love with Maine, uh, uh, was here for just a couple weeks. I didn't do the whole SEER training, but I did two weeks of the SEER school here, fell in love with Maine. And um, I just, I, I, I had in my head that I was going to move back to Tennessee later in life because I'm a sixth generation Tennessean. It's as home to me as, as Alaska is to you. But uh, at this point, like I've got teenage kids that are in five, that five years or so I've got, you know, a couple of young adult, uh, kids, they're going to be, you know, having kids of their own. And, you know, my roots are getting pretty grounded here, uh, yeah. in Maine. So, and, and it's the same, I was in Nome and I was like, man, maybe in another life, this would have been a really cool place to live, but it's just not in the cards for me at this stage in my life. But, um, you were, uh, I, we, we alluded to it before you were cruising right along with your goals, your mushing goals. And, uh, you hit a really big snag last year, um, a really tragic accident. And instead of me, you know, telling our listeners, would you mind just, uh, telling us what happened? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> kind of what had been really the kickoff to, uh, racing season f for years in Alaska is a race on the Denali Highway, um, which you say, wait, a race on a highway. Well, it's actually closed down in the winter. Um, <clears throat> so it actually becomes a trail for um, dog teams and snow machines and cross country skiers and whatever kind of winter sport that you want to do. So the race goes basically from where they stop the highway to this lodge uh, 63 miles. And it's just a one way race. You race the 63 miles and then you come back. Um, so we actually, uh, went out there more for training runs. So we were going to do the 63 mile race. And then we, uh, we hung out for, for a few days and, you know, utilize the highway to do some other training runs. And, uh, on, on the way back, we, uh, the last run, we're headed back to the truck. Um, we had a head on collision with a snow machine and, um, it was, you know, I'm, I can't go into like too much details just because it's really, it's really hard for me, but basically, uh, uh, we lost, uh, three of our main leaders, um, died in the, in the incident. Um, another one severely injured and, and other dogs, um, also injured, maybe not severely. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it, it was really terrible. It was, it was really difficult. Um, you know, not only were the, the dogs that we lost the best leaders, but they were some of, uh, both to me and uh, Jim and, and and other people involved with the kennel, just and to your wife, more right? as, yeah, just more as dogs. They, yeah. they were some of the most m most valued like family members. Yeah. Um. So it was it, it was a really difficult time. It um it was hard on all of us, and um we just like uh we we found a way to to kind of keep going with the season to try to accomplish our goals, um and to, and to try to honor those dogs. Yeah, I know that had to be hard. And, um, and I know that you guys are, are still, there's only so much you can say also because you guys are still, you know, in some legal, uh, things with, uh, the people who hit you. But, um, man, I, I think anybody who's been mushing dogs for any period of time, uh, ha has had those close calls. Um, and so I, I've had enough close calls to know that, um, just, you know, I, I, I've had enough of those close calls to where I can imagine, but I, I don't know, um, just how horrible, uh, that must've been for you guys. Um, I, I, you know, because you have those mental pictures in your head of, wow, that was literally inches from my team, you know, at whatever, 70 miles an hour. And, you know, what, you know, you could be dealing with, um, so, I, I really, I really felt, uh, felt horrible for you guys and, you know, was holding Lanier's and your family up in prayer, uh, last year. I know that had to be a, a really tough go. Um, and, uh, 
I mean, the ones that were injured, um, you ha- have any of them made it back to the team or, um, <coughs> um, so, so two of them, uh, that were kind of, I guess what you would call have a minor sled dog injury or maybe moderate, um, kind of got most of the rest of the year off and they're, they're, um, back in the team for training um thus far so good we're still doing short runs but they look good um the one dog that um got pretty badly injured but made it was this dog named kit kat um now when i first started going to gyms i'd bring my daughter along um and so when i started she was three and the very first time we took her there and she met all the dogs she declared that kit kat was her dog <laughs> that one belonged to her kids love now you, I, don't they? this yeah. is mine yeah now i think it, at first it maybe had something to do with the name it just mm. appealed to her but that was her dog and um the more i ran with jim and i'd tell my daughter about the dogs and the training it was just always kit kat kit kat kit kat um so i knew that one day Kit Kat was going to retire and I was going to make Jim give me that dog to mm-hmm. live at my house. Um, very special dog. So it made it, it made it all the more, uh, honestly terrifying that, uh, we almost lost her. Yeah. Um, luckily we were able to race her, um, to vet care. Now where we were, that was a couple hundred miles away from any vet, um, we were able to uh, to get her to the vet um, to get her life saved, and so she's still with us, and she lives at my house now. Um, <laughs> now she really, truly is my daughter's dog. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah, I you know here we we have these discussions every once in a while. Here in Maine, we have multi use trails, and um, you know cross country skiers as well as dog sledders, as well as snowmobilers. And, uh, you know, the onus is always put on uh, the mushers. You know, it's like, hey, you know, you guys need to wear more reflective stuff. You need to wear more lights. You need to put more. And at some point, it's like, yeah, I mean, we don't want our dogs to get hurt. You know, we're we're doing what we can here. But, you know, at some point, uh, we need our friends that are on the snowmobiles to... uh, to acknowledge that, you know, I, and I get it. I love speed too. Speed is fun, but do it in the open fields, do it on the, you know, wide open lakes, do it where you can, you know, see a mile ahead of you. Don't, don't do it when you're on a snaking trail winding through, uh, you know, a stand of spruce trees and, and, you know, you can't see what's around the next corner. You know, I mean, we, we all train our dogs to, uh, you know, to hold to the right side of the trail. But when you're on those little snaky trails going through the woods, you know, and you've got a long string of dogs in front of you, uh, even if the leaders and, you know, the the point dogs are, are hugging the right, you know, the dogs behind them are, you know, end up cutting the corners. So, well, I kind of see that. I mean, okay. So as, as mushers, we have a responsibility uh, to keep ourselves safe, to keep our dogs safe. But if, if you're doing any other kind of winter sport on those trails, you also have the same responsibility to keep yourself safe. Um, and anyone else that may be with you riding on a snow machine, being pulled in a trailer. Um, and then, so to me, the next step is then everybody using the trail has a responsibility to help keep each other safe. Mm -hmm. What can we do as mushers to make sure that, you know, we're keeping a, uh, cross-country skier or, or somebody ski joring or even somebody on a snow machine safe from harm. It's just that shared social responsibility um, that I wish I saw more of. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, we, we call, <laughs> we call them mass holes here in Maine. Uh, when uh, 90, I'd say 97% of the snowmobilers out on the trail are great. You know, they see the team, you know, they're on vacation, you know, it's a, it's a unique experience. They pull over, they take the photos and, and when they do, because I, I understand that I'm a, an ambassador for the sport, man, I stop my team. Yeah, sure. You can pet my dogs and I'll stop and talk to them for a while. There's, there's a little bad part to that. And the bad part is, is 
then your dogs learn to want to get pets from every snowmobile or they pass. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, as an ambassador for the sport, you know, I, I'm like, you know, I, there are times when I'm like, Hey, do you want me to take a picture of you with my dog team? And I'll let them get down there and pose with my dog team and that kind of thing. And that's, you know, I maybe even more, maybe 99% of the experiences, but you've got the, I'm putting in air quotes, the mass holes. You got the guys that, you know, just spent whatever, you know, $20,000 on a, a, a snow jet and they want to, you know, go see how fast it'll go. And they don't really care about your dogs. And they're all, you know, they're frustrated that your dogs are on the trail and intentionally fly by your team at, at breakneck speeds, even, you know, when you're asking them to, to slow the speed down. And, um, it's, it, it's a scary thing. And, uh, you know, in an ideal world, we'd have trails dedicated just to what we do, but man, you know, when you're, especially when you're training for distance, you know, it's not like you can, it's not like you can groom a hundred miles of trail, you know? Uh, exactly. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. Um, cause, cause I mean, I, I'm sure you would probably feel the same way. Like you would want people to be out enjoying the trails, enjoying the nature. That doesn't mean they have to be a dog musher, um, right. like me, like me or you. Um, and, and so it's part of the it's part of the reality of the situation, you know, try to be a good citizen, try to, you know, try to help people educate as much as you can, um, you know, and just just try to be safe. And and I guess the most you can do is hope that you get that in return. Um, luckily, um, for me, one of the huge benefits that we have in training in Chugiak is we actually have a trail system that is uh, dedicated to mushing only like by municipal ordinance, um, between a, uh, August and April mushing only on our trail system. That's fantastic. And there's only, a, there's only a couple of ways to enter the trail system. Um, so you're not really going to be able to like sneak on with your snow machine. <clears throat> um, so that's really cool. It's, um, you know, we don't have, we, we don't get a ton of mileage on those trails. Um, I end up doing lots of lo lots of loops but it's very terrain and, and lots of good hills and lots of turns and stuff like that um, <coughs> so partially because of that and partially because of what happened and partially because um, I had started to have this uh, desire to have some st sort of mid-distance style event in Chugiak yeah um, I, this is I, I came be up my with, next question, actually. Yeah, yeah I knew okay. where you were going. <laughs> so I came up, so I I came up with this idea. You know, it's we we have a lot of sprint races on the Chugiak trails, and and the parts of the trails that are used for those races, we are, are really super groomed. Those guys do an amazing job. They're hard and fast and perfect for sprint mushing. Um, and then me and kind of the other distance guys, you know, do a lot of work on kind of the other parts of the trail system so that we can get as much mileage out of it as we can. Well, I wanted to, I, I got on the board, um, of the dog mushers association there, and I wanted to figure out a way to have a distance style event there. And so basically what I came up with is we do circles, we do small dog teams and we do circles. Um, and then, uh, after everything that happened, we decided to, um, actually hold that race in honor of the dogs that we lost. Yeah. Um, and we named it after, um, this dog solo, right. um, who, uh, it, it's hard for me to talk about solo. Um, probably the, the easiest way to say it is Jim Lanier has been running dogs, since the early 70s and he said solo was the best leader that wow. he'd ever had and wow. she was barely three wow when we lost her so already at three she was just the yeah. greatest. so so we decided to call the race the solo sweepstakes yeah and it's a pretty unique format i i kind of stole a little bit of the idea from a race they do in uh yellow knife called the underdog 100 yeah yeah where it's a six dog um mid mid or long distance event so we have six dogs and uh you, last year the trail we were able to use you did a uh we had a 17 mile loop so you do that twice rest and then do uh do the loop again so i i think it's a cool way of 
one, um, you know, we get people more, hopefully we get more people on our uh, trail system in Chugiak. Um, you know, two, it's, it's helping to honor the dogs. It's, it's a trail system that's safe or about as safe as you can be yeah. um, in, in terms of other trail users. And then, and then hopefully it allows an opportunity for maybe some kennel that, um, you know, they, they want to race, but they only have so many dogs yeah. and, and most, most distance races, you got to have minimum 12 dogs to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so hopefully it, it affords that opportunity and, and hopefully affords an opportunity for, for maybe handlers of other kennels to get their first, their first crack at racing and camping and that kind of style. So um, we're going to try to keep it going yeah. um, for as long as we can. Yeah. And that, what that's an awesome uh, way to, to commemorate solo. I think that's great. Uh, and I've, I've been in that position. I, for most of my 25 years of mushing, I've been a recreational musher and, you know, uh, fielding even a six dog, 30 mile team at times. Um, you know, I have to borrow a dog here because, you know, I've got one out that's, you know, um, whelping a litter or, or whatever, you know, doesn't have the miles on it, that kind of thing. So, um, it, it is, it is great to have, uh, races like that so that, uh, especially the, the newer people coming on, uh, the next generation can, can participate in it. Um, so I, I know that like, this is a very expensive sport and, uh, you touched on that a little bit. Um, and, uh, and it also requires a lot of, of time and effort from you, um, you know, being out on the trail training, um, how have, have, do you have a, a group of people who are committed to backing you? And like, how are you making all of this happen? I mean, and it sounds like you've got a very supportive wife and, um, you know, that, that, that's worth its weight in gold right there. But, uh, in addition to that, like, you know, how, how are you making all this happen for yourself? Well, yeah, uh, the, the, the biggest thing is, is the support of my wife. I mean, uh, especially with, um, the uh, little kids that we have at home and the, and the time that I have to have to stay away that, you know, she's able to take care of them and in, in the way that they need. Yeah. Um, she's also actually um, not, not just emotionally, but, but financially my biggest uh, uh, supporter. Um, she actually runs a small business um, as well as her regular job um, that she, she kind of helps um you know, out with sponsorship in that way. Um, And then part of it, part of the other interesting part of this is one of the reasons, only reasons I can pull this off is in a weird roundabout way, the pandemic. Mm. Um, So I work uh, for the school district. I'm a technology project manager. And prior to the pandemic, as a a school teacher, I I, I know uh, how well school districts pay. So (laughs) (laughs) Well, as um, pre-pandemic, I was in the office five days a week, um, and that's a bit of a, a commute for me. And, um, you know, we, of course, we did the work from home thing, and, and they kind of allowed us to do uh, more of a hybrid thing, at, you know, after everybody started going back to work. So I... I get to work from home a lot of days and my house is a lot closer to the kennel than it is to my office. So mm-hmm. it, it, it saves me time, um, in that way. And I, and I have a lot of flexibility to be able to keep my job and still do the training that I need to do. And then, um, Jim Lanier is obviously a big part of it. Not only is he the owner of the kennel, um, but, you have not seen such a spry 83 year old man as Jim Lanier. Uh, he's out there working every day, you know, feeding <clears throat> dogs, um, working on various projects in the kennel. Um, so, so he's a big key to it. His wife, Anna, um, is also, you know, super supportive. Um, she's really great with dog care, always, um, has good advice on that kind of stuff helps us take care of the dogs and then there's just um other people that um over the p- 
past couple of years have trained with us. Um, so some kind of come and train when they can, you know, just uh, other people kind of helping out. I do most of the training on the race team um, uh, myself, but you know, it takes a, it takes a village and um, sure does. there's a lot of people um, that really love the Northern whites and, and, and put their heart and soul into it. And, and lucky for me, those people want to see me succeed um, w- with the dog team and, uh, and make it to know. That's great. That's great. So looking, um, looking, I've got just a couple more questions for you. Uh, looking to the, I did a rod, uh, which is just around the corner in mush in mushroom, uh, in mushroom months. <laughs> um, what excites you the most about what's coming up and what gives you the most anxiety? Um, what excites me the most is just, is just to be out there with, with the dogs. Um, there is, uh, I I've seen some of that trail, uh, maybe as far as, as Squintna, but beyond that, it's pretty much going to be all new to me. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's the, the famous kind of some of the famous parts that people say to worry about, you know, the gorge and the stat, yeah. steps and all that stuff. And I, that, that gets me excited. I'm like, yeah, yeah I want to like, see what, what all the, what all the fun. And every about year, those in every year, those notorious spots are different. I mean, mm-hmm. it depends on some, some years there's so much snow that, you know, they're riding down on fluff and other years it's, uh, you know, rock solid ice, you know, you, you just never yeah. know from year to year. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited for that. But I think, um, I think most of all is, you know, I, I'm not the owner of these dogs, but I, I I'm very bonded to them. I see them every day. Um, a lot of them, I, that will probably be on the race team. I harness broke them and I have run almost every single mile they've ever you're, run. You're completely them. invested in these dogs at this point. Yeah. yeah. And so I think about once I'm a few or maybe even just a couple days into Iditarod, um, you know, as compared to the mid distance races where you go to a checkpoint and you have your dog truck there and you have your handlers there, you're really out there by yourself on Iditarod. And it just excites me to be like, I get to take however long it takes to somewhere around two weeks of just time with nobody else, just me and these animals that I love and adore and am bonded with and get to experience Alaska um, in that way. Um, that's probably what excites me uh, the most is, is to be out there doing that. It's spoken like a true musher. That, that's, <laughs> that's the heart of a musher right there. Anything about it giving you uh, um, anxiety? I mean, it, for me, um, like leading up to the expedition I'm doing in January, it's not the being out there on the trail and, and the dangers there. It's the logistics and the, 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 the planning and the preparation. Is there anything that uh, keeps you wake up in the middle of the night and are unable to fall back to sleep because your brain starts working on it? That kind of thing. Um, sometimes like just all the potential checklists and checklists that I already have going to like figure it all out um, a little bit. Um, it's, it's a lot of logistics. Luckily I have people that are helping me with that and people that have done, I did or odd before and, um, are able to help with that kind of stuff. I think most of, um, if I get anxious about anything, it's sometimes I get a little bit anxious about like the things that you can't control, Mm -hmm. right? Like I, um, I'm really invested in doing this race and I really want to get to Nome and, and get the belt buckle and, and, and check this thing off of my bucket list. Um, but you know that <laughs> <clears throat> the dogs have to, have to want to do it and have yeah. to be able to do it too. Yeah. And sometimes things happen on races yeah. that you've done everything right. And for whatever reason, it leads to a scratch. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I think about things like that and I, I try to think about ways in training I can kind of mitigate those risks. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but then ultimately it's like, Hey, you know, you can control what you can control. To, if something like that happens, that happens. I try to not get, be too anxious about it and then, uh, just keep, keep pushing forward. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, turn, turn the worry about the things you can control into action and the things that you can't control. Uh, just trust that, you know, um, worrying about it's not going to, not going to change what, what could be and should be. And I, I often say that, um, that worry and anxiety is the worst occupation for an active imagination. And, uh, so, you know, just like you said, do the things you can do and, and not sweat the rest, man. I'm excited to watch you. I'm going to be watching you with my students. Um, maybe I could get you, uh, to zoom in with my students at some point before or after the race. Um, I'm pretty sure that we'll have several, my students get to pick the musher that they want to follow. And I'm sure we're going to have several that will be following you. Um, tell, tell me how, uh, and for our listeners, those who don't know, I mean, I've met Mike, uh, I followed Mike for a while and, uh, what you're hearing is, is the heart of a true musher here. And, uh, I'm just excited for you, man. I'm, I'm a big fan of what you're doing and excited to see you succeed. Um, so what, what can our listeners do to, uh, to support you and to help you reach your goals? Um, yeah, so you can, um, you can check out, uh, it's my website is sleddogparker.com. Um, I'm at sled dog Parker on, uh, on social media. Um, and we do, um, uh, we do on the website, uh, have a dog sponsorship program. There's still some dogs that we're looking for, uh, a sponsorship on. And then, you know, if you want to, if you want to be a part of the team, if you believe in what we're doing and, wa and want to support, um, you can find information on, uh, on my website and, uh, contribute in any little or big way possible, I guess. All right. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get all of that information and make sure it's in the show notes. Thanks a lot, man. Um, really happy. I got this opportunity to do the podcast. We'll have to get you out uh on a, on a training run uh, when you get to alaska before uh before you start the expedition maybe i'll show you around uh Chugu. yeah I, I i'd love that i'd love that we are planning on getting into this i i would love to take the whole season up there um but uh you know i am a school teacher and uh, <laughs> but we do plan to get there about a week early and uh i'm gonna stretch the dog's legs and um uh maybe uh, break some trail um because the villagers are telling us that they don't even travel in late January until the second week of February. They're not even traveling between villages along the Yukon that early in the season. So uh, the first first 200, 250 miles are going to be, um, well, I mean, it's all going to be interesting, but those first couple yeah. hundred miles yeah, are going to be sure. pretty interesting. Sure. <laughs> well, God bless you, brother. And uh, thanks for taking the time. And I look for, forward to connecting with you soon and uh, getting this up so uh, everybody can check it out. Right on. Thanks, man. All Appreciate right. It. Talk to you later.